Okay. I believe we are good to go. It was perfect timing. Yeah. Just yeah. stop drinking the water. Hey, yeah. um, so thank you everybody for joining. I know we had a huge, uh, huge boost of people that kind of jumped in the last couple of minutes. So uh, thank you for everybody for joining. This is our first Super Stonk Live AMA, which is AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. For those of you who don't know, I am here today with Dr. Suzanne Trimbath, the author of several books, but most recently, um, or what we're going to be covering today is the author of Naked, Short, and Greedy, which is Wall Street's Failure to Deliver. So thank you for joining us today. May I call you Dr. T? Yes, please. Okay, great. Excellent. So um, how are you doing? You ready for this? Yeah, I'm all set, really. Ready? It's, Good. Uh, so, I'm very excited. Excellent. Yeah, I'm glad. Um, I feel like we are going to finally get this out. We're finally going to get it in front of people that um, that can honestly just keep asking what's going on, and you're here to provide answers. So would you go ahead and walk through a brief intro of uh, your background? You know your your expertise a lot better than anyone else. So, Yeah, so um, pretty much all of my career has been in finance. Um, I knew from an early age that I wanted to study money basically and how money works. So I've worked with uh, insurance companies, uh, federal reserve banks, stock exchanges, clearing settlement. Uh, that's been, was my career through uh, the time that I went to grad school. 1994 is when I left uh, the poster trust company in New York and, uh, and did my PhD in economics at New York university. And then went to the Milken Institute where I did um, capital markets research for a couple of years. Uh, before going out on my own. I've been uh, doing independent research in finance and economics uh, since uh, 2003, 2003, yeah. So um, wow. I, I do wanna say that I've probably forgotten more than most people will ever know about back office operations, like all the post-trade stuff, centralized clearing and settlement. I also uh, worked in Russia on a foreign aid project to help them build trade clearing and settlement systems when they shifted from communism to capitalism. Um, Man. My expertise is post-trade, not trading or trading operations. So um, post-trade is really my gig. And uh, there are other people who can answer a lot of questions about you know, hedge funds, dark pools, trading strategies, that kind of thing. That's, uh, that's not really what I know most about. So I mean, I, I've studied, I took you know, an investment class in college uh, so I know enough about it, but um, really everything that happens backstage at Wall Street, that's really where my expertise lies. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so important and incredible about having you on here because um, a lot of people are just trying to figure out, get a look inside the DTC. We've been talking and been posting about, you know, hey, this stuff is going on, but having you here to actually help us explain that um, and, and to really dive into the kind of a follow-up of, I wrote this, this post about a week ago called the house of cards, which you have um, generously spent time reviewing as well as the everything short. And uh, a lot of people want to know just high level. Um, how close were we? How closely related were we? Um, are we trying to shout the same message? Yeah. So the house of cards is a lot more of what I know. Everything short. There's a lot of stuff in there. That's really not in my wheelhouse. <clears throat> so I offered you some comments on that but I don't think I can be as helpful there on the house of cards. Um, yeah, I think like there were some things that you caught on to about um, like rule changes at uh, DTC about not allowing issuers to say, I don't want to be in the, in the depository. Like most people would have missed that because that, that really came about as a result of one issuer telling their shareholders to pull their certificates out of the system. So rather than leaving their shares in street name with their broker to get them registered in their own names. And that was, it had been done on a small scale before, but for this issuer, a lot of people were organized. A lot of the investors were organized and they, they really, uh, I mean, pretty much everything came out, you know, with, yes. with out of there. Yeah. And that was the point where DTC said issuers can't request this. Now an individual can still ask to have their shares registered in their own name. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, GameStop is has a um, direct registration, a direct stock purchase program uh, where you can, in fact, just buy your shares from them. I think the minimum purchase is twenty five dollars for a one time mm -hmm. buy. Um, but so so you can still do it. But that was so that it, that finding that in the House of Cards really showed me that you've done a lot of background research um, and I come up with some of the things that a lot of people missed. 
there were a few problems in there. The big one for me is think that CD and Co is a company or yes, a city, yeah. an entity, right? So CD and Co uh, is what you call is a nominee name, and you should think trustee, custodian. So when anyone and all of the banks and brokers have a nominee name that they use for securities registration, um, anyone who any shares that are registered in a nominee name that signals the issuer that these are not held for that company that they're actually held for someone else, right? And a uh, bit of trivia, CD and Co, C-E-D-E, -E, that was actually C, the letter C, D, Central Depository. They started out as mm. a department at the New York Stock Exchange. And when they need to get a nominee name to hold securities for uh, trade settlement, they used CD, CD and Co. Interesting. Thank you mm -hmm. for clearing that up. Thank you for the compliment and thank you for clearing that up. Um, yes, so that, that was a, a Definitely a big thing. Um, I was hearing a couple of a couple of people talk about maybe it was certificate depository, but kind of coming from gospel there. So I'm going to take you on uh, use the credible source on that. That's interesting. That's yes, good to know. That's central so. because that's where uh, all of the New York Stock Exchange members could deposit shares there, certificates there, and they would hold it for them so they could use it for settlement. Because in the in the late in the '60s, you know, <clears throat> there was this paperwork crisis on Wall Street where there was simply could not get shares transferred, re-registered from one name to the next when you sold securities in time for a two week settlement cycle. Mm. So mm. imagine as you're trying to go to T plus five, T plus three, T plus two, how, right. how difficult it became. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know you've drilled in a, a couple of really, really big points in your book about um, your, your personal opinion, your personal feedback on on some T plus 10 settlements. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and, and get into uh, we've got a jam packed hour here, folks. We are trying to cover big course level, uh, you know, big college course level stuff. And, and the entirety of her book is almost a 30, 350 page book. We're trying to condense that down. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what I want us to start doing is um, so we we what we're trying to say here is that there are these shares that are just kind of floating around being borrowed and being lent and lent again. And it creates this problem as we will we'll get into um, where there's just no, really nobody knows exactly what is going on or who owns what. Um, we just know that there are more shares out there than, than um, the company had really originally issued. So I'd like to go through and kind of walk through um, a typical example for, for someone. We have to also keep in mind that there are a lot of people that don't understand the words or the terminology that we're throwing out. So we really want to drive that home. Um, let's take one example and talk about where a uh, in a perfect world, how would a short sale or a naked short sale be be actually held in account and, and, and kept accountable? How would that go in a, in a perfect world? So in a perfect world, there would be no naked short selling, period. Like that's, yeah. that's really an exception. That's, uh, you know, market makers. There are, in most underwriting agreements, there's a little clause that the issuer agrees that the underwriter and the remarketing agents can, in fact, at some time sell more shares than they actually have in order to, make, to keep the market flowing, right, to, to meet the demand. Aside from that, in a perfect world, there would not be, in fact, if I were an issuer, I wouldn't agree to that. Um, but in a typical short sell, the um, retail customer puts in an order to short sell the stock, the broker finds somewhere to borrow it so they can make delivery. They either uh, pre-borrow or borrow at least within two days of executing the trade. And the borrowed shares are then delivered to the buyer who then gets all the rights and entitlements to dividends and voting rights. Hmm. Yes. So, so yeah, so the, yeah, we're going to talk, we're going to drill onto that too. So the, the rights are actually being transferred along with the share that's being borrowed and that share may be borrowed multiple times, correct? It can, it's not supposed to be, but it certainly can be. There's no, um, it's really because the bar, because the buyer, uh, often doesn't know that they're getting a borrowed share, right? There was a time in the seventies when, uh, you know, brokerage broker, you know, friends of mine with broker experience told me that they would not accept borrowed shares at settlement because of the chance that that share was actually, uh, they were borrowing a borrowed share, right? So yeah. they would only say they would not be the buyer and basically wouldn't be the buyer in a short sale. 
And, and that required, of course, and this I think starts to get into in the not so perfect world. <laughs> yeah, the perfect segue as right. you feel free. As you feel free. Yeah. In the not so perfect world, um, the short seller, uh, even one who borrows, may or may not mark the trade. I say mark the trade, that's old school. You actually used to have a piece of paper and you would write short on that piece of paper and say, I'm short selling 100 shares of something or other. Um, Are these the short sale indicators that we've seen on FINRA reports? Failure to mark a short sale indicator? Okay. Yes, it used to be that you actually wrote it on a piece of paper, but now it's all electronic, so there's something in there. Um, so so if, they, if the seller, the short seller knew that buyers would not accept borrowed shares, they might in fact just forget to mark it short, right? Mm -hmm. So that there's no record of a short sell anywhere, not at the exchange level and certainly not, there's no indication to the buyer that they're gonna be they're gonna be receiving borrowed shares. So that's so, one problem, just not so marking the short sales. Really quick there so I can understand. Um, so that is in, in essence a way for them to say, okay, the system wouldn't typically allow for someone to take a share that was marked as short or marked as borrowed. And by excluding that, it, it doesn't give the indicator that there's a difference between a long, a long sale or a short sale. So it allows it to go through with the system. Right, the, the, the buyer would uh, is the one who wouldn't allow it. So it's not that the system wouldn't allow a, short, a, a share to be sold. But short. the buyer doesn't know the difference. The buyer doesn't know the difference, but in mm. at the brokerage level right broker to broker they know when that trade when they when they put that trade together the short seller knows he's selling short right right and then if they but if they don't turn on the indicator and that's where the rules violations come in especially mm -hmm. post reg show right in the 04 period that became a major issue because the number yes. of shares circulating was so much greater than the short sales right mm -hmm. so so that's one problem that occurs the other one is that you mark the sell short and you, um, you know, pinky promise that you're gonna <laughs> say you're gonna deliver the shares, yeah. but then you forgot to borrow them, didn't borrow them, thought you could get them, but then you couldn't get them. And, you know, maybe someone promised that they would lend them to you. And then at the last minute they go, oh no, I can't lend them. So there would be, so that's another problem that occurs, right? That sure. even if you marked it short, you may or may not be able to get the borrowed shares to deliver. So on that point, I think that's a great way to segue into um, you spend a lot of time in your book talking about Patrick Byrne and overstock. Um, I yeah. think it, it speaks volumes to you were using words. I think you were being very generous in saying accidentally or, or um, you know, may not have, you know, left out something that they that we should have covered. But oh, sorry, we forgot. Um, would you go and give an overview of what happened with Patrick and Overstock? I think that's, yeah, so that's, that's I really interesting. Patrick was very active. You know, he's this crusader and, and uh, self-declared crusader for against naked short selling. Um, so there was the there's a group called the uh, North American Securities uh, Administrator. So every state has a securities administrator, um, someone who takes care of the rules inside their own um, their own organization. Uh, I'll find the well, anyway. I'll probably get some dates wrong and some names wrong. But that's fine. So that's the, fine. so the, so they had a they this whole thing was coming up and companies and investors were complaining to their state at the state level because they weren't getting action from the SEC. They're complaining about, you know, this naked short selling and short selling and stock loan and all that. So they called a um, panel panel discussion in Washington, D.C. at the end of 2005. Uh, and I was one of the people that was on the that was on the panel. And I knew in the audience that there were investors and CEOs of companies. I did not know Patrick at that time, but I knew that people like him were in the audience. Uh, I, I stunned them by presenting a report from the Securities Transfer Association that indicated that of the 285 proxy votes, proxy vote is the corporate annual meeting vote of the shareholders, that of 285 cases examined, all 285 had overvotes. Overvotes mean that they got more votes in than they had shares outstanding, right? That's incredible. <laughs> Sometimes by by large amounts, right? Yeah. One hundred percent. Now, just to be clear, the problem's a little better now. I think last year it was only eighty five percent of the test cases had ever mm -hmm. but it's far from fixed. So, so when I so they were really shocked, and um, 
I put out a challenge to all of the CEOs in the audience. I told them, I said, when you go back to your office, buy 10,000 shares of your own company. And and three at that time, it was T plus three. Three days later, the broker is going to take the money out of your account and it's going to say that you got your shares. Ask them if they really got the shares. Now, if you or I went to a broker and asked that question, they go, oh, yes, I see it right here. It's in your account. But sure. when you have the purchasing yeah. power of a, of a corporate CEO, you have a tighter connection where they're going to really mm -hmm. dig into it and make sure. Uh, and he took him. So finally, eventually, his um, um, broker or firm, the, his broker at the firm, yes. uh, told them that, in fact, they did not get the shares. And that multiple attempts to purchase the shares to replace what he didn't get had also failed, that there simply were no shares available to meet his purchase. Now, they definitely... They and we're talking $50 million worth of shares. They took like right? his money and yeah. they're happy to keep his money, but they knew that they didn't have the shares for him. It took yes. him two months, two months. And he's the CEO of the company of the stock that he's buying. Exactly. <laughs> That's now, he, pretty sketchy. <laughs> it's very sketchy. So yeah. he shared with me and I redacted the name of his broker, but he shared with me and gave me permission to, to use that publicly because I think it's a prime example of just how, like as a retail investor, you're dealing with a retail broker and that retail broker does not know backstage, right? They know exactly. what's, on the records in front of them, they don't know what's backstage. So, so that was um that was really, you know, that caught a lot of attention. And Bob Drummond from Bloomberg Magazine, in Bloomberg Markets Magazine in 2005, did a multi-page article called the um, Proxy Voting Charade, hmm. all about all, st coming stemming from his attendance at that meeting and being hit in the face with this idea that. Uh, there are simply people are voting shares, right? They're voting in annual meetings. They're voting in matters of corporate governance, which are so important. And yet their votes are not counted because there's too many votes coming in. Exactly. And we're actually dealing with that right now with GameStop. We are dealing with the proxy voting with GameStop um, and kind of tying that back in there. We did have a volume chart. Um, I know that a lot of people that have been following GameStop know this as well. Um, you and I talked briefly about this before, but uh, when we got into the peak here before the run up in January, we were having upwards of 180 million shares a day. For GameStop being traded, yeah. 197 was the peak there. 197 million. We're talking about circulating the same stock four times <laughs> and, in one um, day. In one day, their entire capital. So that number of shares outstanding. That's their. That's their capital statement, right? Mm -hmm. That's on yep. their balance sheet. That's what they report to the Secretary of State in the state where they're incorporated about what their capitalization is like. Mm -hmm. And in one day. <laughs> It's crazy, right? It's it's yeah. it's incredible, um, and that kind of is a really good uh, a good point. I know you just a couple of other points there. On top of that, that wasn't the only lawsuit um, that we were talking about here as well. We had you know so in addition to Patrick, we had in two thousand and six there were lawsuits filed against eleven prime brokers for allegedly doing the same exact thing, um, and they were conspiring to do this uh, basically according to your book. Just talking about that, right? And um, that ET, that was the electronic trading group ETG yes. um, filed the lawsuit. I. I believe it was settled out of court. I don't think that there's any public information about the resolution, but and this it's is just really, another example. It's, it's a really important point, though, because we want to talk about 65 million shares that the company issued, and you know, 180 or 100, 210 million almost, shares, almost purchased, 200 million. Right? Yeah. So this was this was uh, ETG's complaint was that their financial model for shorting a particular stock included the fact that the shares were borrowed and would eventually have to close the short and replace them. Yes. And if the brokers were shorting the stock, the prime, their prime brokers, right? The guys that they're giving, they're a fund, they're giving their uh, orders, their trade orders to some group. And if that group is not borrowing the shares to deliver, then that ruins their financial model. Can you and segue from this into the, uh, into the triumvirate of trouble? Because I feel yeah. like that's kind of what you're touching on here. So, so right. it's not just the naked short selling, but we have these ad other additional factors. You care to elaborate on that? Sure. So the triumvirate of trouble. I've been, I've been, I've got 
you know, I used to do slideshows down in, for the, you know, in New York to try to explain this to people. And the triumvirate of trouble is shorts, fells, and loans. Shorts, naked or otherwise, even a short that's covered by a borrowed share will in fact increase the number of shares in circulation. So while that right. share is out on loan, there are actually two people who, one person who really owns it and one person who kind of owns it, like they have a marker and then eventually the shares will be delivered back to them and they'll have their ownership, right? So, right. so even a short that's covered by a loan is a problem. And then when you throw in fails to deliver, which means that long or short, you just don't show up at settlement with shares. All of those add to this increase in that what is the denominator, and I don't want to get too mathy on you, but sure, I know that yeah. very, I know there's some very uh, highly educated and technical persons in your audience. So the denominator in the financial ratios is shares outstanding. One half is bigger than one third. So as sure. you increase that denominator, you decrease the values, right? Yep. So so it just throws all those financial ratios out the window. Yeah. And then, and then, um, are there any, uh, we know in your book, you do a good job of explaining this, but just high level, what are the incentives for these companies to fail to deliver instead of just covering their shorts like they're supposed to? So that's a, that's kind of a trade type question, but I will say this up until very recently, there was no penalty for failing to deliver. Um, when we can talk about this, you know, uh, some in more detail, but um, until very recently, uh, recently the uh, NSCC and others have started to put in uh, penalties. There's a flat fee penalty. There's a per dollar val value pen penalty. There's a, a VIG, like an interest that's charged per day, not delivered, right? So, so they right. started to put some of those in. And, and so there was a paper done in the, early 2000s by a researcher at the SEC that talked about strategic fails to deliver. That in fact, it's a strategy mm -hmm. whereby I take your money and I give you nothing. I pay a little fee to the, you know, whoever I failed to deliver to, I give them a little, well, a little cash, <laughs> right? Yeah, fine, whatever it is. Um, in the meantime, I have your money. So for two months, Patrick Burns broker had use of his $10 million. I forget what the number was, but $10 million that they could invest overnight. They could buy other stocks. They, I mean, right. So yeah, they've got the money now they're in control. Cash. So to me, that's incentive enough. <laughs> if there's sure. no punishment other than a, a slap on the wrist, then, you know, no one's going to come out and break your kneecaps because you didn't, you know, <laughs> pay back the, the shares. You didn't exactly. Deliver, right? Yeah. You just get this little fine, and and for most of them, they're able to uh, earn enough on your, you know, when they have your cash, that it that it's worthwhile. Wow. So you mentioned uh, that DTC. And I would want to kind of segue from there uh, into the oversight and competence and the involvement section. Um, so what did the DTC do when they would receive these complaints? So they they would, uh, you know, can you kind of walk through how that that management info system kept track of these these issues? Right. So I worked in troubleshooting at DTC and uh, troubleshooting, we dealt with all, all the operational, um, everything that didn't balance in operations. We sent something to a transfer agent to have it re-registered in CD and Co's name from, you know, Merrill Lynch or whatever. And, you know, it's a month later and it hasn't come back yet. So that item appears on the list for the supervisors in the morning. There's a similar a similar activity in the vault. For example, they get a break list every morning. It says this is what is on the shelf, and this is what we're supposed to have. Right? This is what the system says is on the shelf. This is what we're supposed to have. Figure out why it's different. Settlement uh, gets one that says, you know, these shares were supposed to come in and they didn't. The only one that doesn't get that list is money, because on the money side, if you don't deliver your money by four o'clock someone's on the phone calling you to get your money. So that's a whole different thing. We're just talking about sure. the share size. So those lists, and I know from you know my work in troubleshooting, those lists are sorted by value, right? So we have an aged fails, aged transfers, whatever it is. They always come out by value and you always hit the big value items first, right? So what uh, in Storm Q2, and I talked about this as well, as the, 
as the brokers continue to short or they could short the stock, they do that, they continue selling more than buying to push the price down. As they push the price down, they can in fact uh, keep dropping that item further down the list, the priority list for investigation mm -hmm. at the DTCC because now it has a lower value, right? You're, and think, you're intentionally lowering and reducing the priority of a stock. Yeah in order to, to and i think this question yeah. came up a related question came up in the um uh, uh ama that i read um i can't remember who it was from but you know could could the company like what happens when the company goes out right so if the, mm -hmm. so the so the end game in naked shorting is that you deny the issuer access to capital by pushing down the stock price so the way that they raise capital is they come out and issue new stock so you're getting bigger and bigger shares of equity for less and less money, right? Right, okay. So, right, so if your yeah. stock price is up, that's when you want to issue more equity because you're getting, the, the issuer's gonna get that Which cash. Which GameStop is taking advantage of right now too. The market price is high, it's a good time to, good time to make some cash, right? That's the time to do it because they, if they need capital, if they want to raise capital, that's the way to do it. By pushing the stock price down, the, they, they are denying the um, issuer access to capital. If the capital is really important, I mean, if you don't have money to like to expand your business, buy new equipment, you know, do you know capital purchases, exactly. eventually they can drive the, the the company out of business. Once they do that, then all of the fails, shorts, loans, everything is erased because the stock's declared worthless. Right. Technically, it's declared worthless after. If you can't get a share transferred, re-registered from one name to another for two years then DTCC can, or DTC actually, can declare the stock worthless. And at that point, they just archive the records and shred the certificates. So at that point, and then that was one of the questions that came up in the AMA is that, and it's directly related to this, like there's so much damage done, not just to the investors, of course, the investors suffer. I'd say 7,500 companies, no. about 7,500 companies or something have been, have been put in a coffin because of stuff like this. It's hard. It's hard to say. I I, I I just remember something similar to that in the book, and it's just it, it's mind blowing that this is that systematic. Yeah, That's it, what well, I'm really trying to say. There are companies that you know get started and fail and go out of business. I mean, that does happen. So they had to mm -hmm. have a procedure to do this. But the idea of like, it, it, but it's just very official. It's like two years can't make a transfer, sure. declared worthless. Uh, the broker deletes your position. They you know. They shred the certificates, and then that's the end game. That's the end game for the uh, uh, asset grab, in particular. Mm. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just it's it's just that story to me, especially about the uh, having the option. Is it if in audit and in, you're all about these internal controls, where you're saying, where do you have this incentive? Where do you have the opportunity to maybe cheat the system? And that was just man, that is a red flag. That is. That is on top of some of these other points that you talked about, we, we can hit these real quick. Um, in 2008, the banks that were the source of these failures to deliver right. uh, began to see their own shares fail to deliver. And so to protect them, the SEC stepped in and stopped short sales against the securities, but just the securities of those banks. Exactly. And that was the um, uh, full I mean, <laughs> brothers went to Congress and said, you know, help me, help me. They're naked shorting my company now. But they're the perpetrators. <laughs> and it sounds too them. familiar. It sounds too familiar to what just happened with Robin Hood and GameStop not too long ago. Well, and, and then um, on, on the sort of the other side of that coin is that in, and I do want need to mention this, in Europe and Asia, when they went after, when they tried to stop naked short selling, they stopped it in all the stocks. It wasn't just the banks. In the US, we're, they only protected the banks, which I think is, you know, again, I mean, that's a really big red flag. Why yeah. were we protecting the banks when, in fact, the banks were the ones who were doing most of it? And so when a lot of these SEC examiners would come over to the DTC, like uh, people that are behind the scenes and outside of this, we have this impression that, you know, like these people are being parented. You know, mom and dad are making sure the kids aren't, aren't breaking the law. Um, but when they would come and, and they would talk with you initially, generally the first question out of their mouth was, was what? What does, what does DTC do? 
What does the DTC even do? And yeah. when when you mentioned another point in here that said uh, it's e it's easier to pass a FINRA exam in order to become a broker or to be, to be someone that was uh, licensed to buy and sell stock, it's easier to get a it, to pass that FINRA exam than it is to get your barber's license. In most states, yeah, yeah, most that states is just mind blowing. Really on that, it's not it's not that difficult to do. And a lot of times uh, people will get hired and trained on the job while they're passing their series seven license. So it's not, look there, they just have to know some fundamentals. There's a, that's why you have things like the certified uh, financial analyst, right? CFAs, CFAs and, yeah, right. Because that's a, that's an, an additional designation beyond, I understand the mechanics of uh, stock trading. It's, I understand something about the financial analysis behind and, it. And to that point, you were, um, I think you said like 73% of some, or 73% or, 73 or of the exam was basically them telling people which stocks to invest in, as opposed to, to just like, which, uh, what the process of this is, it was basically like advising almost in that FINRA exam. Um, yeah, yeah. That, and that FINRA, um, uh, exam, there's, you know, if you just, you can Google that up, you can see, um, some of the questions, you can see sample questions. You know, it's it, it's pretty well, it's pretty uh, accessible. <sighs> Unreal. So uh, to to kind of group this in, so um, I feel like this is a good time to talk because people probably wonder why I'm not asking direct questions. So what we've done is we've taken a list of of questions that were pertinent to this conversation, and I've gone through and grouped them into about twenty uh, twenty questions that were grouped on based like failed to, to deliver or uh, regulation or compliance and oversight. And so as we have this conversation, I'm tr I'm trickling those questions in, and then afterward when we post the 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 um, the follow-up, which should be posted after this, we have mods on the back end of this actually taking live notes while we're writing. Um, those people will be able to see the questions and they will they will get the shout out there. But we had a lot of questions on this with the regulation. I think a lot of people don't know that these people are SROs, this self-regulatory uh, organization, and they, they don't fall under the realm of Sarbanes-Oxley, don't fall under the realm of, of Dodd-Frank and some other regulatory um, acts. So, it, it's just overwhelming the stuff that you put in your book to directly address this, not only like the, the, the triumvirate of trouble, but, but then how this is allowed to be pervasive and, and the system actually allows these people to fail to deliver, um, which is something that we have to start, as you mentioned, raising the pitchforks about this has to be brought out in that, that level of an audience. Yeah. Yeah. Your pitchfork moment, bonfire of the yeah. band. You just got to find that point where you're going to say, okay, enough is enough. Um, and I really need to to stand up and do something. Um, there was a question from. Um, I just need to go back just a second. It's this is your call. Go for it. Okay, yeah, it looks it's all good. you. So, uh, like, I don't really speak emoji, and um, <laughs> okay. I actually called you Autobit, right? And said, "Based on <laughs> you're not the first." Oh, can I mispronounce your handle? Like, I'm sorry. So, um, Happy Sheeple Three asked the question about like, what can you do? Um, and I got sort of a similar question from Rower, R-O-W-R, like, what can we do? And so um, the, I need to go back because it was N-A-S-A-A.org, N-A-S-A-A.org. Oh, okay. yeah, right. yeah, yeah. they, they put together that um, uh, panel discussion in Washington where, you know, the I was The overstock case is what you're referring to here? Uh, the overstock, but also NYSE was there and they had to admit, you know, some of the things that they did on the proxy side. So the NAS, NASAA.org, they have a button right at the top of their homepage that says contact your state uh, uh, securities administrator, right? So mm -hmm. you, they're the people who are most interested in the complaints that you have about, you know, corporate governance and, you know, what's happening to the companies uh, in the state where you are, right? So, so I did want to mention that. Um, and then um, on, just on the voting itself, um, what do you do? Like you said, right now, GME is in proxy season. And there's yes. a story about overstock in the book as well, about but they their proxy, what happened at their annual meeting when they got more votes in. And mm -hmm. they fact, knew for a fact that members of Patrick's family did not receive their proxies, so were unable to vote, right? There's um there's a guy by the name of there's a there's a website called inspectors dash of dash election.com. Inspectors. We'll link this stuff down below. Right? And, yeah. yeah. And 
you can, the, the company, and then the company has to do this. The investors don't do this. The company hires an inspector of elections, someone like Carl Hagberg, for example, um, who will actually go in and, and try to figure out, like if you get, if, you know, in my view, and this is Carl Hagberg's view as well, and he's much more experienced on that side of the business than I am. Okay. If you're an issuer and you get more votes in than you have shares outstanding, you should not accept those election results. You need to stop. It seems straightforward. All the yeah. And get this thing straightened out. This this will help to reveal evidence if there is naked shorting, if there are fails to deliver, whatever's going on, it can be revealed. Like that's the there are a few things that bubble up. There's a lot about fails to deliver and naked short selling that you will never find in public information. Right. And even intentionally, the, I'm arguing intentionally too. Yes. Yeah. And, and even the issuers have a hard time finding out exactly what's going on with their own stock. Right. This is this is a, a long term problem. But there are a few things that bubble up, and one of them is is during the annual meeting when it comes to voting. Now, after we raised this issue in 05, there were um, a Broadridge who processes a lot of this um, electronic electronically. Put in a offered a service to the brokers. They can pay so that if they report more shares to be voted than they have held at DTC, then Broadridge will tell them to fix it before they tell the issuer. And that's probably mm -hmm. how we got 15% of the overvotes down, right? So we went from 100% right. of the test cases to only 85% of the test cases because Broadridge will, so DTC says. Um, of the million shares held by CD and Co, you know, a hundred thousand are Goldman, a hundred thousand are Merrill, et cetera. Right. And then, and then Broadridge goes to Goldman and says, you have a hundred thousand shares. Who, who do we send the voting material to? And they send back 200,000 or 150,000 shares. Broadridge will tell them, I'm sorry, but you only have a hundred thousand. You need to fix this. Well, that means that in Goldman system, they had, and I'm, I don't know this is Goldman, I'm just picking on them because they're a big name. Um, in their system somewhere, they actually had retail investors with in their accounts, marked in their account, that they had more shares than actually existed. GameStop is bouncing between 100 and 200 percent in the past couple of months. Institutional ownership. Yeah, so that's a really important point. And the institutions uh, are also really get up in arms about this. So the uh, uh, proxy voting charade, Bob Drummond, 2005, Bloomberg Markets Magazine. He's got a lot of details in there to help anybody who wants to understand that issue more, more in more detail. And you do a great job too of talking about all of this stuff in your book, um, which has, by the way, you have a huge, huge demand for an audible book right now too. So, uh, so I mean, we can talk a little bit more about that offline, but. Um, well, I did. I will say, I do want to let you know. I talked with the um, publisher, and he is—he's uh, in London, so he's—he's uh, in, in contact with the Royal National Institute for the Blind, and mm -hmm. that's not an audible, right? I mean, it's not an audio book for commercial purposes, but we are trying to make it available for people who are sight impaired. There you go. You heard it first. So, got that in the works. That's—that's uh, that's incredible. That is excellent. Um, would you go? Would you mind if we went ahead and transitioned? We're we're doing good on time. I think we're probably running maybe about five minutes behind. But um, let's go ahead and jump into into looking at the evidence. So we're trying to lay out the groundwork of right, what what's happened here. We've got these shares that are just that have been rehypothecated to oblivion. We have the DTC that is not really um, really doing a whole lot to to kind of or, or any sort of agency that's in charge of this looks like they're they're more incentivized to keep the problem going um and we're trying to blow the lid off of that but looking at the evidence going forward i'm going to be writing the a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here in the house of cards too and so um you mentioned a bunch of stuff in the book about some of these numbers that uh, i'd like to go over just high level and then we can kind of discuss what the implications of some of those might be so um right there up at the top i've got more than a third of companies receive up to 25 percent more votes than they have shares outstanding. That's on page 55 of your book. Uh, that's that direct evidence of what we're talking about here. And now the really want to drill into the FTDs because that's where that's where we're getting to the uh, the money with this is the open positions due to NSCC. And these are quotes from your book. Uh, three billion, uh, three point four billion. Let's just round it up there. 
um, or round, rounded out there. 3.4 billion open positions due to the NSCC. Open positions due by participants with the NSCC was 2.45 billion. Uh, that results in open total fails of 5.8 billion. I believe this was a 2005. Um, a 2000 two and yeah, something like that. Or so, 2005 or 2007 or something. Um, and, and from that, mm -hmm. I pulled the same report 2019 right. and 2020, 2020's total. And they've, they've thrown this euphemism on there. Now it is no longer fails. It is open positions with enrollees or what does the, what does they say? They refer to these as open positions for which a trade guarantee is applied. <laughs> like, right. Okay. So and the, the, and the only time a trade guarantee applies is when there's a fail because yeah. Otherwise, it's not. It's just uh, due next week or next month yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. So, would yeah. you be surprised to know that your five billion dollar figure in two thousand and five, basically pre financial crisis of 08, has turned into a hundred and eighty three billion dollar figure? Right. No, not really. Uh, okay. But re keep in mind, part of that is that there are more issues uh, being traded in. Um, there are, what should I say, uh, like there's more types of issues. So since uh, 2005, 2006, NSCC has added, um, you know, ETFs, um, mutual funds. They've got some bonds running through there. So there's, there's mm -hmm. you know, more activity, more numbers, et cetera. That's certainly true. But that's, so that's why when you use those figures in House of Cards or everything short, you know, I always encourage people to put a de put a denominator on there. Make that distinction, yes. Right? So it's yeah. you know, it's it's a multiple of something, it's a fraction of something. So when I look at the hundred and eighty open positions, I go back to the I want to go look at the um, uh, clearing fund because yes. if in fact that hundred and eighty three billion dollars doesn't show up, it's the clearing fund that NSCC would draw on to cover that. Right. So mm -hmm. that's so that's for me, that's the denominator. Like, is that a multiple or a fraction in in the, uh, you know, oh, three oh four oh five, If there were 40 times like the fails were 40 times the clearing fund. So yeah. that if those fails really failed. There was there was no way it's to game cover. over. It's yeah. game over. Uh, so, and we're going to talk a little bit more, too, about uh, some of these DTC proposals that have come out. I really want to pick your brain on those. Um, but uh, yeah, and that that jump from 183 uh, or to 183 billion was up 40 billion alone from 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and then to your point about the clearing funds, we're going to get into the kind of the nitty gritty here about the clearing funds. But another point you illustrated in your book was keeping the ratio or the volume of stock that's being traded on the NICE, and then as as a comparison showing um, what's that figure here? We have a volume increase for a period yeah. between 99 and 2002 to 2003 to 2006. So three years to three years, volume of total trades increased by about 29% for the same time frame and same comparison, a 95% jump in failure to deliver. So I never met a number I didn't like. <laughs> so let me I'll be a little more mathy with you. So the thing was like, yes. So when you when when reporters or whatever would go to DTCC and say, hey, why is the volume the value of fails gone from six billion to one hundred eighty three billion? We do more trades. We you know trade values are rising. Uh, you know, but as a percentage of all transactions process is still a very small, less than a fraction of one percent. But what I'm looking at is what's that change across time? So if right. one is increasing much, so if volume, trade volume is the deal, that's what's driving fails. There's just more trades and so fails are going up. Then the trade volume, the change in trade volume should somehow parallel, should be correlated somehow. And yeah. as a numbers person, I look at that and I go, just not. Like it's just not, not there. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, it. it, it to the point that you just brought up about that clearing fund. I mean, uh, if people have been reading and following my posts it, and your book talked about um, failures to deliver jumping like a thousand percent or, or not a thousand, uh, but a hundred percent. I also noticed these liabilities, these assets going up. Citadel was somebody hard not to ignore in my first post about Citadel has no clothes. Um, I don't think that you actually reviewed that, but the point I'm trying to make is 
that asset side and in the um, their short or the liability side with their short positions has jumped 100%. The assets are actually held by the DTC that are supposed to be used to cover those. Uh, and then also looking at the clearing fund balance from the NSCC, we have another 100% jump. So 2019, we had clearing fund balance of just under 4 billion and the 2020 clearing fund balance is just under 13 billion. Um, and, uh, or excuse me, that was 2015 being just under four and then in 2020, so five years later, and there was a 119% jump in just 2019 to 2020 alone. So you talk about that amount that's being held to cover these shorts and they say, well, we'll have less failures if we just have a bigger deposit account. Well, there's, there's a relationship between the two now, right? So in, so in the coming leading up to the 2008 financial crisis, um, I uh, made the points in several places that uh, what we just talked about, that the clearing fund was a fraction of the fails, right? That, that the risk in the system that was building up in the system was enormous. Mm. You know, that there was, you know, cause that's, you know, now they have too big to fail status. Blah, right. blah, blah. Okay. So after yeah, that, free card, right? Right. So probably in, and I've forgotten the year, like I said, uh, so probably 09, 2010, something like that. Prior to that, there was no um, no calculation for the clearing fund that included fails. So it was based mm, okay. on activity. The more trades you did, the bigger your end of day settlement, the more you had to put into your fund. That's how the participants put, all put in different amounts based on what their activity is. Right. But the fails were not calculated in there until after the financial crisis. And then finally, at that point, it was um, that was included in there. So as the fails rise, now that clearing fund should be going up with it and coming down with it. I think it's still short. I don't think I'm it's not it's definitely not bigger than the fails. Let's put it that way. Uh, right. Although yeah. it's not as far apart. But again, you have to look at this across time. Like, what are the changes? And then. And one thing that um, really, uh, you know, I, as I read House of Cards and everything short, you're looking at notes to financial statements. That's where all the good stuff is, right? Yeah. That's where what, if you want information about those NSCC fails, that's where it is. Um, one sentence can change your entire interpretation of what you just read in the previous page. Right, exactly. And then yep. the other thing is that um, DTCC and all of its subsidiaries are self-regulatory organizations, which means that they are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all of their rule changes, price increases, everything that they do has to be uh, uh, submitted to the SEC, subject to public review, open for comment. I haven't worked at DTC since 1993. And the way I keep my knowledge updated is by watching their rule changes and watching. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I look at their financial statements. They have continued to put less and less of what you really yeah. want in there. Yeah. And that, you know, that's that reminds me of that old Paul Simon song, you know, make a new plan, Stan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as mm -hmm. soon as you shine a light on something that you see that's not right, the cockroaches run from the kitchen, right? Right, they, right. So, you talk about rehypothecate, the problem is really resubmit, reprice, right? And and each time a fail occurs, it gets resubmitted for the next day's settlement as opposed to being called out, right? Called sure. out. And if it were called out, then you could start to really see those numbers come down. Wow. Oh. Thank you for the insight on that. Um, and I know we are getting a, a, a pretty close warning here. Um, still, we could spend so much time. I appreciate all the time you've spent. I want to jump into um, the recent proposals with the, uh, the uh, DTC. We can spend just a couple of minutes covering this and kind of what your implications are. So the 003 filing is, is telling them, uh, instead of doing this monthly reconciliation, we are going to do this daily reconciliation to make sure that you're not getting too out of hand. Right. So, so give me some thoughts yeah, so on that. That's a, that's a really, that's kind of a minor technical point because okay. every participant receives a statement, their settlement statement. Uh, they get an early one and they, then they get a final one. They get a position report. I say report because, you know, I'm old school. They used to actually print paper. Right. And out the paper yeah. right? Now they go online. There's a term like online. Mm -hmm. And they, in their, uh, you know, when they become members of DTC, they agree that they are responsible every day for letting DTC know or NSCC know if there's something off, 
right? If there's something that NSCC and DTC thinks is in their uh, account or shows in their account is not what they think it should be, they have, and it used to be like three days to get back. So, but once a month or once a quarter, they would have them actually sign, physically sign the paper and send it in and say, yes, we really looked at it, right? But, but that's, but to say it went from quarterly to monthly to daily, it's sort of a technical correction because in fact, they were always responsible for always right. making sure that was right. Yeah. Okay. And what about the 801 ruling saying, uh, you know, if we find out that your funds not as, as up to date as it needs to be, we can, we can require you to update that deposit with, within one hour. What do you think? Right. So I think that's, uh, this, and someone on the AMA asked the question about, um, you know, is, you know, is the Reddit making a difference? Is the GME followers, are you making a difference? I think that this is clear evidence that it is. So when you, you know, you're really calling attention to a problem and then you start to see rule changes coming out from the DTCC and its subsidiaries, that's an indication that in fact, you've had an impact that they, that they are starting to look at this and say, you know what, maybe we need to check this you know, this fails balance more often because you know, once a month wasn't enough. We should do this every day because look, you, you, you know, look at the, the GameStop, uh, not only the dollar value, but also the number of shares, right? Exploded. Right. So right. their risk can become very, can rapidly grow very quickly. Um, yeah. The other thing is that um, one other thing I want to mention is CSDR. It's the um, Central Securities Depository Regulations that are going in in yeah. Europe. Um, if you looked at uh, euroclear.com, for example, just uh, type, you know, search for CSD regulation, uh, you'll find all the information on this. The, this was supposed to go in in 2019. No, yeah, 2019, then they delayed it to 2020, then the pandemic hit, it was 2021, now it's 2022. Okay, so it's pushed back. But right. what it says right. basically is you may not fail. If mm. you fail, it's mandatory that, that the, uh, buyer can go into the market, get the shares, replace what you failed to deliver, and charge you the difference. Which is what the the rule removed was back in the day, where they removed that buy in rule, that mandatory buy in rule um, within the U.S. Correct? Well, it's it's always just been voluntary in the U.S. Oh, well, good to know. I okay. I, there were some circumstances where it's mandatory, but it's basically voluntary. But they're going to make it mandatory wow. because if the buy in fails the depository will reverse the trade. That's putting pressure on all of the uh, DTCC members in all right. categories, because if they have to comply in Europe, uh, they pretty much have to comply here too. Yeah, it gets hard to maintain two separate books there. <laughs> right, right. Okay. so they're wow. going to be watching this much more closely. There's so much more going on. And look, I'm, I'm just so uh, grateful for the encouragement that I've received from the super stock people. I mean, it's just been, it's what keeps me going <laughs> when I'm glad I to hear you say that about the outcomes because the, the, what can we do next is always hard because yeah. it's very specific. And if we, it's not just one thing that can be fixed, that's going to create, you know, the brand new world. There are lots of, lots of things that need to be changed. And each time you call attention to one problem, you know, the dark pools arise, right? So there's no. always this, the phantom well, the big picture is beautiful. Tries to hide it away, right? So I would be, you know, look, we can talk about doing another uh, AMA. Uh, because I was actually just, yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask you, um, it's a really good transition in. I know we were going to, we could kind of go through some solutions, but honestly, if, if we have some opportunity to do this again, look, I, I wanted to, to kind of wrap up my end of this by saying, um, I'm sorry that you never were able to get this to this level. But now there are, we have a quarter of a million people wow. that are, are starting to beg and demand answers. And that pitchfork army that you wanted so desperately is here. And my question to you is, would you be open to working, um, you know, at your time and being able to, you know, review different posts that I might be submitted to you? We can work on the House of Cards, too, and really start to get this stuff uh, ironed out and, and, and get the people the, uh, the tools that they need in order to get this stuff pushed in and, and get this taken care of. Yeah. And uh, Stonky2 has a way to send docs to me and mm -hmm. uh, keep me, you know, point me to uh, the DDs and the God level. Due diligence. Yep. Like, yep. Yeah. Due diligence, deep dive. <laughs> you learn. 
I have tried, I'm learning, yes. I'm yeah. definitely beginning to read hieroglyphics. And, uh, <laughs> and I had trouble like, just going on the site and finding things. It's a bit confusing for me. But anyway, yes, I'm happy to do that uh, as time allows. And and also, you know, the you know, there's quite there's a lot of information in the naked short ingredient. Thank you for mentioning that. But the other book, Lessons Not Learned, also I have that too. London. I'm looking forward to reading that one. So that one has the that's for the techies, right? If you're mm -hmm. if you're a technical analyst, uh, if you want to look at laws, rules, regs, the history of how many times have we, you know, bailed out banks and brokers. Yeah. Forever, right. So right. all of that's in there. But the naked, short and greedy is a narrative. So I wanted to write it and establish more storytelling. And so if you Good. but if you want to do that, the deeper dive, the other book would be helpful to people. But I'm going to keep you open. I'm yeah. going to I'm going to be in contact with you. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I'm happy. And by to the do way, that. FYI, you've officially been dubbed the Jane Goodall of the ape troop now. So uh, thank you very much for, yeah, for someone, your someone called me. Queen uh, Queen Kong of the Apes. Queen, yeah. Get used Queen to it. Kong you're gonna have Kong. a lot. Of, you're gonna have a lot of names like that. So, Doctor mm -hmm. T, thank you again so much. Uh, I mean, wow, we just we just blew through that. There's a lot of info in an hour. I appreciate your time, and um, that's why the book is so thick. <laughs> that's why it was. So uh, I appreciate you so much. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, look forward to the follow up coming out. Just shouldn't be too long, and uh, we'll be in touch. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're safe.